Let's turn our Bibles to John 6, and let me pray as we move into preaching of God's Word. <clears throat> Father, I just ask that uh, you would be with us this morning, just as Rick was praying, the Lord, that you would work in our hearts, that you would open the eyes of our hearts, that we would see spiritual realities, and that, Lord, that you would excite us to belief. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. June 1859, Charles Blondin, a famous French tightrope walker, became the first person to cross a tightrope stretched across Niagara Falls. More than, more than a quarter mile long, suspended 160 feet above, above the falls, he wowed the crowd by performing daring feats as he crossed the gorge several times. And each time in a different way. Once he did it on stilts, once on a bike, once blindfolded. A large crowd gathered to watch, with each feet bringing louder and louder applause. Then at a follow-up performance, the crowd ooed and awed as Blondin carefully walked across one dangerous step after another, pushing a wheelbarrow, holding a huge sack of potatoes. At one point, he asked the crowd, do you believe I can carry a person across in this wheelbarrow? The crowd enthusiastically yelled, yes, yes, we believe. You are the greatest tightrope walker in the world, and we believe. He said, okay. Okay, says Blondin. Who wants to get into the wheelbarrow? <laughs> nobody, nobody was willing to get into the wheelbarrow that day. They said they believed. They believed that they believed, but they didn't truly believe. And so we have come to a point in John's gospel where it was time for those who were following Jesus to get into the wheelbarrow. Jesus had just concluded his great message on the bread of life. We talked about it last week. He's in the synagogue at Capernaum, and he ends his whole sermon on a very offensive note saying, you must eat my flesh and you must drink my blood. He tells them, you have to be able to eat my flesh in the sense that you take me as the one who nourishes the soul. You have to be willing to drink my blood in the sense that you accept my sacrificial death. And not only did they not get into the wheelbarrow, they turned their backs on him and no longer walked with him. Let's read this passage. It'll be 60, verses 60, chapter 6, verses 60 through 71. I'm just going to read the whole passage, and then we'll come back, and we'll kind of step through it. But here's John's account. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. And then John tells us, For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe, and who it was who would betray him. And Jesus said, This is why I told you that no one can come to the Father, come, can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. Verse 66, we've been, we've been looking at this all month. After this, many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Verse 67, so Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the 12? And yet one of you is a devil. 
And he spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. In these, as we step through this, we'll look at these first few verses. And in these first six verses, we're going to examine unbelief that leads to their defection. Then we'll finish up our time in the, in the second part, this last part of John 6, by examining belief that's marked by affection. See, we, we've been talking, this is kind of like an autopsy on belief. This John 6, it's the, the, they believed it and I believe this is who believed this is what it looks like to believe, not believe, etc. Oh, we have all of those things. And what we see today is we see unbelief that leads to defection. And we see belief that leads to affection. Which one is it for you? First, the three marks of unbelief that lead to defection. There's three marks. And we're going to see it here. We're going to see that they take offense at the word of God. We'll see that they can't see past the flesh, this world. And we'll see that they don't follow Jesus. Verse 60. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? They heard it. What did they hear? Jesus' words. They heard what he said. Eat my flesh. Drink my blood. You're going to have to embrace the fact that I am the Messiah. You're going to have to believe that I am the Savior, the only hope, the only bread of life who came down from heaven and you have to embrace me and you have to embrace my death. And they said, this is a hard saying. (laughs) What you just said right there, that's hard. Christ's teaching were hard to accept. Now the Greek word for hard here is skleros. And it doesn't mean hard to understand. It means it's hard to tolerate. It's harsh. See, so so long as Christ's followers could not understand him, they stuck around. They asked questions. It's when he spoke and they understood him that they left. What they heard was so contrary to their own views that they would not accept it. And that's why they say, who can listen to it? Who can listen to it? Meaning that they were, they're not going to pay attention. They did not want to be troubled with difficult teaching. I think it's interesting as I'm studying this, I'm looking at this, I kind of had one of those Oh, moments. You're like, oh, that's clear. Note this. It wasn't the works of Jesus that they had a problem with. It was his words. It was his teaching that made them defect. John 5, verse 24, we have a truly, truly statement. If you've been studying John with us, you, you know that that kind of perks the ears up, right? Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. The key to life is to hear his words and believe. Throughout all of the gospel of John, we have Jesus doing these miraculous things, these signs But it's like two or three sentences. This is what he did. This is what he did. This is what he did. And then you have paragraphs and chapters on him explaining it with his words. This is what this physical stuff is pointing to. He's making it clear that all of the works that he's doing are simply symbols of a deeper reality. And that deeper reality is found in the content of what he says. The word that he speaks. This is important because oftentimes we are comfortable as long as he doesn't speak. We are uncomfortable when he speaks because as long as he doesn't speak, then I don't have to come to grips with a reality where I'm not in control, a reality where I'm not king. 
One of the examples of this difficult truth, this difficult gospel truth is in the area of election. It's what we've referred to already as the tension of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. This truth that causes us to ask the question, how can God draw us and yet give us free will? We see it in this passage right here. Now, this could get a little confusing because I'm going to kind of jump forward. We're just in 60 now. I'm going to jump forward. I'm going to draw from Jesus' words in 64 through 65. He says this. He says this. These are his words that they had a hard time with, right? But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it's granted him by the Father. Wait, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Jesus, you mean you knew who wouldn't believe? You knew who would betray you? You want me to come to you, but I can't come unless the Father lets me? How do I resolve that? That's a hard saying. And Jesus says this. He says, this is why I told you that no one would come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. What do you mean this is why you told me? See, Jesus, this is amazing. When we look at this story, don't, don't picture Jesus like standing up there going like this. None of you believed. Ah, it's breaking his heart. And where does Jesus go? Jesus finds comfort and rest in this solution to that difficult dilemma. And just he just he just like like there's not going to be something to believe. God is sovereign over us. The Father is sovereign all of those things. And now you're not going to believe me. I'm telling you that I know these things. And what he's doing is he's leaning hard on divine sovereignty. He's troubled in his soul, and where does he go? To divine sovereignty. He did it in verses 37 through 39 of this very chapter. He does it in verses 44 and 45. He just, he, he just gets, he gets moved by the lack of belief. And he moves and leans into the sovereignty of God. I think it's interesting that Jesus takes this hard teaching that he teaches over and over and over and he doesn't find for us some kind of middle ground. He simply says, the sinner is responsible for his unbelief. And no one can be saved unless he willfully believes. Yet when it's all said and done, it's all. Salvation is all the outworking of a divine, sovereign miracle. It's the gospel. Is it a hard truth? Yeah. Do I understand it? Yeah. Do you hear me trying to explain it? No. But it's good news. God is in control. And he's saying these things on purpose. As if he's saying, are you listening to the words that are coming out of my mouth? And they're saying, yeah. Yeah. And they're too hard. Another example of truth that we oppose, that we find offensive, is something we see in John as well. It's the gospel truth regarding God's providential sending of difficult things. Trials. Why is life hard? He sends hardships and disasters. And we ask ourselves, what kind of God do we have who puts us through this kind of testing? We saw it in this chapter on the Sea of Galilee, in the storm, in control of it all. What kind of Jesus, what kind of God do we have that would put us through that? Well, we have the kind of God who brings us through that. We have the kind of God that draws us through those trials so that we will get our eyes off the now and this world and see something greater, a greater reality, the spiritual. 
We need to be careful, ladies and gentlemen, because we like our nice Jesus who does nice stuff, like good nice stuff, like cool stuff. I mean, look at, you look at this passage here, or this, this book. I mean, who can reject somebody who takes care of little children? And blesses them and takes care of widows and cares for the sick and people who are dying and puts an end to a funeral by raising a dead person. I mean, who is going to reject that person? Those who don't believe, that's who. See, unbelief is so resistant to the words of Jesus that we're willing to walk away from his works. Did you see that? Did you see that? There is no indication that Jesus is going to stop doing the things that, they, that he's been doing, the things that draw them, the good things, that, that all of these things. That's the Jesus that we want. But when they heard his words, when they heard that he was the one who could give eternal life and that you had to embrace him fully, that you had to embrace his death fully and his bloodshed fully. That they had to share in his sufferings because of that belief. When they heard that, what he had said, they said this. This is a hard word. Who can listen to this? Not me. I'm not getting into the wheelbarrow no matter how much I like the show. That takes us to this second mark of unbelief, the fact that we can't see past the flesh. In his response, Jesus points and says, here's your problem. Verse 61, but Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. They went from grumbling to stumbling. You see that? They were stumbling. Scandalizo, because I'm a Greek scholar, right? We, we get this, this go from grumbling, I'm not sure I'm liking what you're saying, to actually being a block for them. 1 Corinthians 1, through 23 says this, Jews demand signs. This is Paul, he's writing to the Corinthian church, the church at Corinth. Jews demand signs. Sounds kind of like maybe John. And Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. What is it? It's a scandaliso. It's a stumbling block to Jews. And it's folly to Gentiles. He's saying, look, you you were so enamored by what I did. You were so fast to embrace the works, the miracles. I mean, you, you embraced those things. But when the words came and you understood what they meant... When you understood the signs and were called to believe that was too much for you, so you grumbled, then you stumbled. Verse 62, then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? In other words, what if you saw me go back to heaven? You're having a hard time with me saying that I'm from heaven? What if I went back? What if you saw that? Could you then believe that I had come from heaven? Would you see that spiritual reality? Verse 63, he says, look, it's the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Again, we have the words that he has spoken. And his words are spirit and life. The people listening to Jesus, they're hung up on the flesh. And that's no help at all. 
When Jesus talked about flesh and blood, they were stuck. They were unable to see the spiritual significance of his words. It's a major theme throughout all of John. This is his point. Get your mind off this world. Get it to things that matter. We miss it over and over. Or the people that that he's talking to miss it over and over. Chapter 2, he said to the Jews, destroy this, this Jesus, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. And everybody listening to him, they're thinking about, well, you, you, he's talking about the building that's, that's on Mount Moriah. And John tells us that Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body, symbolized by that building. John chapter 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus says, how can I be born again? I can't, back, I can't get back into my mother's womb. Nicodemus is thinking gynecology, and Jesus is talking about eternal life. He's talking about the gift of life imparted, which physical birth symbolizes. Chapter 4, Jesus is saying to the woman at the well, if you knew who it is that is speaking to you, you would ask of me, and I would give you water that would spring up into eternal life. And she thought he was talking about plumbing. She says to him, give me this water so I don't have to come here anymore to draw. Jesus went on and he discusses and he, he talks to her, making it clear to her that he was talking about the gift of life. And again, in this chapter, we see he's talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, but he's not talking about cannibalism. He's talking about belief and believing into his life and his death. Over and over, Jesus directs our gaze to the spiritual, to divine reality, to real truth, the truth that we ought to be concerned about getting and believing and fighting for. The importance of setting our minds on spiritual things, on words of Christ versus fleshly thoughts of man is highlighted by Uh, A passage from the prophet Isaiah as he writes about the coming Messiah. You can turn your Bibles. I'll have it on the screen. Isaiah 50. This was one of those. This was another one of those moments in study where I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I, I see now. Isaiah 50, verse 4. He speaks, this being Isaiah, of the Messiah as being given the tongue of the learned. Chapter 50, verse 4. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. Sustain a word with him who is weary that he might learn how to talk to the broken, the hurting, the disappointed, the discouraged in life. This is talking about the Messiah, giving this word, able to comfort. He had learned how to speak to the weary, and his, we- and his words give life. Now at the end of this same passage, verse 11 Speaking through the prophet, God contrasts the word that the Messiah will speak with the words that men speak to each other. It's a little bit cryptic, but I'm explaining it here. Verse 11 says, Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who equip yourselves with burning torches. What he's talking about is he's giving us a picture of natural man. The man of the flesh who depends on his own wisdom to get things going. He's kindling fires. He's lighting brands everywhere by his own natural energy. That's, what he's, that's the picture he's given. This is, this is man on his own, kindling, getting all, trying to get all these things going. So God says to him, walk by the light of your fire, by the torches that you have kindled. This Have you, I'm sorry, this you have from my hand, you shall lie down in torment. What does he mean? 
The words of the Messiah, of Jesus, are truth about life. And if you miss them, if you follow the distortions of the world and think you've adequate wisdom of your own to work out the difficulties of this life, then you will be so far removed from reality. You will be dealing with such fantasies, such false concepts that when you lie down at night, you will be unable to sleep. You will lie down in torment, frustrated in your ambitions, angry that you cannot make things fit together, tormented and tortured because you cannot make life work. And that is what Jesus is saying. My words are spirit and life. Anything else is of the flesh. And it profits nothing. Now finally, we see the third mark of unbelief. They don't follow Christ. Verse 66 says, After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Hmm. Here is the final word on these false disciples. Eventually, those who take offense at the word of God, eventually, those who can't see reality beyond the flesh of this world, defect. They unfollow God. They don't like what he says, so they block him. Many of his disciples withdrew. They weren't walking with him anymore. And again, they didn't refuse his works. They refused his words. People did it then. People do it now. Some of you are doing this. We'll do this. Some of you are sitting here and you're experiencing those trials that we've talked about, the pressures of life. You're struggling with parents, your spouse, your kids, your career, the economy, maybe all of those, all at the same time, and you feel the pressures of it, the pressures of it, pressures of it, pressures of it. And you're wondering, where's this good guy gig getting me? Where's nice Jesus? When's he going to fix all this stuff? And if that's what's in your mind, and if that's what you're thinking, then you are in unbelief. You're having a hard time with his words. And here's the message. Eventually, if it hasn't already happened, your torment will cause you to leave. I've shared with you a close friend of mine who has walked away from his family. He's walked away from his friends because he's walked away from God. It's not uncommon. If you've been around the church for any length of time, as pastors, we can get together and we will talk about and lament how many people we could pour our lives into. How many people have you poured your life into just to see them walk away? I mean, how tragic for a parent to raise up their child just to see them walk away. What's going on there? You terrible parent? No. They don't believe. When the pressures of life cloud their vision for the eternal, it's logical to leave. Pretty good news, huh? But wait, there's more. We're not left with just that because even though we have those marks of unbelief that lead us to defection, we also have this vivid, clear picture of belief that leads to affection. Verse 67, 
Many will walk away. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answers him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. See, here, here is the mark of a true believer. Not just a pseudo follower, but a true believer. He cannot quit. When Jesus said to them, Will you go away also? I mean, there's some real, live, just tenderness of the creator, God of the universe. In this moment, they turn their back. They walk away, and he goes to his closest, and he says, will you go away also? And Peter says three things. First, he says, to whom shall we go? Lord, we, we, we've been thinking about this. We've been looking at all this. We, but where else can we go? We can't not believe in you. And then he says this. He says, you have what? The words of eternal life. What you say to us has met our deepest need. What you say to us us has delivered us from our sins and freed us from our fears. Your words, Lord, are the most remarkable words we've ever heard. They explain us. They explain life to us. They satisfy us. Nobody speaks like you do. Nobody understands life like you do. And that holds us. And finally, he says, we've seen your character. We have believed. We have come to know. Peter's saying, we've watched you. We've come to see that your words match your deeds. We believe that you are the Holy One of God. You're the sinless one spoken of in the Old Testament. You are God. All of those prophecies. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, all of them are fulfilled in you. You have drawn us. You've compelled us. You are the incomparable Christ. To whom else shall we go? We can't not believe in you. They'd come. They examined They saw his signs, they heard his words, and they believed. And when they did, they couldn't help but treasure Christ. They couldn't help but see his worth. They saw in Jesus a love that can never be fathomed. A life that can never die. A righteousness that can never be tarnished. A peace that can never be understood. A rest that can never be disturbed. A joy that can never be diminished. A hope that can never be disappointed. A glory that can never be clouded. A light that can never be darkened. A happiness that can never be interrupted. A strength that can never be weakened. A purity that can never be defiled. A beauty that can never be marred. A wisdom that can never be baffled. And resources that can never be exhausted. If you have found Jesus to be like that, where else can you go? This is the testimony of those who walk with him and follow him. The best definition of a Christian is someone who cannot quit. Let's finish this chapter by looking at Judas at the end. Verse 70, Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the 12? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the 12, was going to betray him. That's how John ends this scene. 
See, Peter was wrong about one thing. As amazing as his response was, he was wrong about one thing. Do you see it? He said, we, we, by that he means the 12. We have believed. We have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. We treasure you. And Jesus corrects him with more hard words. Saying, no, Peter, there's one here who does not believe. And in these two verses, Jesus exposes him. It's Judas. It's Judas. The poster boy of unbelief. He's the one who represents all of those who walked away. And Jesus is just simply making the point that I chose him. We see in Luke that that Jesus, he he prayed. He called those disciples based upon prayer. Jesus gave Judas power. I mean, they, they just came off that ministry, the missionary journey. Remember that? Where they go out and they're preaching and they're healing. Guess who was a part of that? It was Judas. And Jesus is saying, look, I knew. I know. This is part of the plan. Leaning once again on God's sovereignty. By God's providential sovereign design, there was one of the 12 who was going to betray him. Perhaps to give us a picture of what it might look like for us to be in the midst of God's people but not really believe. He's the poster boy, but he's not a solitary monster. Judas isn't. He's a devil. He's one who opposes. He's in it for himself. He wants to use Jesus. He wants to use his miracles, but he opposes his word. So as we conclude this morning, and as John leads us in communion, be thinking. It's it's a lot of what Rick was saying saying during the prayer. It says, God, just show our heart. Show us where we are. Where am I in this affection versus defection? Some of you have started well, but you'll drop out. You won't want to be bothered with studying and searching and understanding. You won't want to follow truth once you see it. And you'll rationalize it. And you'll drift away. And you'll even drift away reasoning in God's name why you should be drifting away. If that's you this morning, then you can respond this way. Here's the hope of the good news of the gospel of grace. You can ask him to teach you and open your eyes and lead you on and show you who he is. And there's some of you in this crowd that will never leave. You can't leave. And by God's grace, your life has shown that you can't leave. You have been through it. You're going through it. You're fighting for faith. It doesn't mean that you're not struggling or not having doubts and all those kind of things, but you're going through all of that struggling, all of those doubts, through all of those circumstances, and you come to the conclusion, where else can I go? There is no way I can't believe. Lord, to whom can I go? Let's end our time there. And prepare our hearts for communion. Let's pray. Father God, we're grateful for the opportunity this morning to be reminded of your words. And the design of your words. To open our eyes to your value. To your glory. 
Lord, do your work in us. Stir up the affection of our hearts. Guard us, Father God, from trying to stir it up ourselves, trying to save ourselves. Lord, I pray that you would give us eyes to see real truth. The reality of the spiritual. Amen.